normally when there are sort of book talks and you know it's sort of fiction or whatever, it, you know, people sort of ask the author, well, you know, what made you write this book? And in this case, um, there were two or three things that pushed me to write it, but one of them, um, I was going to ask any of you, have ever, any of you ever been involved in something, something that you, you were either personally involved in or something that you have direct knowledge of, and did you... Have you ever had the experience of then reading something in the media about it? Oh, yes. <laughs> How accurate. <laughs> <laughs> you, you get my point. Um, <laughs> I've had that many times in my life. And um, when it comes to transport, um, it is a subject which is surrounded by myths. Myths which are propagated by the media, myths which are believed and, and spread by, by politicians, myths which are widely believed by the general public, and even in some case by some transport professionals, and it's that that really gets me. Um, and so if, after having spent several years listening to a number of these urban myths, um, I decided I've, I've got to do something about this. And so, as you'll see, the, the, the first half of the book is all about myth-busting. Um, it starts off with a, a quiz of ten questions. So, for example, one of them is, what happened to the duty on petrol between the year 2000 and 2012? I don't know if some of you have actually read it or seen this online. What did, those of you who haven't, what, what did you guess? Between 2000 and 2012, what, what do you think happened to the duty on petrol? The level all went down. Yeah, it actually it went down by 16% mm. when allowing for inflation, which you have to do because it's unlike yeah, it's VAT or something, it's denominated in pence per litre. Now, of course, you wouldn't get that from the media. And, um, you know, when I've done these sort of talks at bigger audiences, I've had people in some cases guessing that it doubled over that time. And you might be forgiven for believing that, you know, given the way that some of these things are discussed. There's another chapter which is entitled All We Need Is Better Public Transport. And this is something I hear all the time. And this is actually, I, I hear sometimes from people with whom I may actually share similar values. And I kind of understand why they're saying it. But um, a common view that says, well, if we had just really good, really cheap, really frequent, available public transport for everybody, that would make a huge difference to, to, uh, to traffic and to congestion. Lovely idea. Unfortunately, it's just not true, for reasons that um, you'll, you'll see if you read the book. Um, so one of the questions is asks people to guess what proportion of commuters in uh, Manchester take the tram and what would you guess for that? 5%? 10 I'd say. Yeah those are the kind of typical guess. The answer is 1.4%. Is now that's not because the trams are not being used. Right? The trams are very well used and in some cases they're, you know, they, they've been uh, hacked to the gunnels and they've had to sort of extend the system and add additional vehicles and so on but um, you'll see the sort of the significance of all of that if you read that chapter. So the sort of the, the titles of the the chapters of the first part, um, each one summarises a whole group of these sorts of myths. So there's there has been a war on the motorist is one. Roads and airports benefit the economy. All we need is better public transport. Car ownership isn't a problem, only car use. That's a common line that I've heard from so many transport planners and for reasons which in many cases are spurious for, again, which you'll, you'll see. And then you'll never get people over here cycling like the Dutch. <laughs> There's um, an important sort of theme as I've picked up um, on my travels and deal with in the book is this idea that somehow it's in their culture. That's why they do it. It's part of their culture and you can't, you can't take ideas from one place and just put them somewhere else, you know, and impose them on a totally different culture, it won't work. 
Well, sometimes that argument can be right, and sometimes it's total rubbish. And um, you read in that chapter some examples which would cast doubt on some of those arguments, which are regularly sort of trotted out by transport planners, highways engineers, and, and many politicians. The second part of the book is about solutions. And this was the other thing that I, I mean, I'd written in different bits and in academic sources and so on, but I felt that here was an experience that was crying out for a, for a wider audience. Um, I was very lucky over the, the three years that uh, I was doing my PhD in that I, I was able to actually take off for entire summers so, and take off on my bike. Um, I probably took a total of about six months over the, the three summers, cycled about 5,000 miles over uh, seven different European countries and visited, my, my PhD was particularly about car-free development and you'll read about that in the book, but, but along the way I also visited several of the best examples of European cities that have succeeded in taming the effect of traffic, in um, changing the way people travel and also in improving the sort of urban environment and the the way of life in, in their cities. Um, <clears throat> and when I came back at the end of each of those summers, I, I came back with a sort of a mixture of inspiration and, and frustration. There was one of the, the things I remember saying to several people, anybody who was willing to listen at the time, that well, there's no rocket science in any of this. There's nothing that I have seen in any of these places that we could not do here. Now there are a number of institutional differences, there are, you know, in most European countries, though not all, <coughs> um, the, the municipal authorities have greater, uh, have greater delegated powers, um, they are able to control more of their own revenues than is the case in this country. That certainly helps. Um, but most of the difference is really about political will, and that's something which can be changed. I don't know, have any of you ever read, um, seen online or whatever, any of these sort of best practice examples? On these transport? Kind of, yeah, on transport, or, or indeed on anything else, you know. Here's a, you, I, don't, I don't know if your impression was like mine, but I mean, there's, um, there's a a website called eltis.eu, which is run by the European Union, which is typical of this sort of thing. And you'll see all these case studies of you know, places like Freiburg and um, you know, great examples. And you start reading this sort of stuff and you think, well, firstly, the sun always shines in these places. Um, nothing ever goes wrong. And I realised that actually that is a big part of the problem. Um, that... In a sense, what that, that, that whole culture was doing, it was giving a get-out excuse to so many of the, you know, the professionals and the politicians you know, who were able to sort of say, oh, of course, they can do all that over there. You know, everybody born the other side of Calais has the sustainable transport gene. That's, that's why they can do all this sort of stuff. Um, and they don't have all the problems that we have. You know, they, they can implement stuff. Now, of course, when you actually start researching some of these things and you go and talk to people and you, you do digging, you find that's total rubbish. In most of these cases, particularly the cities where they've done these radical changes, they suffered all the same problems that we would be afflicted with or have been afflicted with um, when we tried some similar things over here. So, um, you know, Freiburg, for example, has uh, uh, an element of the local media that sort of loves green bashing. And um, when there were, uh, in the, the, the Carfrey district of Vauban, when there was, uh, there was an incident of um, vandalism of cars, all of a sudden it was blamed on eco-terrorists and all this. Uh, in reality, it was probably kids like it is everywhere else, you know. Um, Problems sort of like um, shopkeepers refusing to believe or believing that the world will come to an end if you take away parking or if you, uh, you know, cut off roads or 
um, you know, filter out traffic. And, you know, if, if you read the, the story of, of Groningen in the Netherlands, which is one of the best examples, I think, of all the cities that I've visited, it was warfare there for many years between the Chamber of Commerce and the local council. Now today, sort of 30 odd years afterwards, and 40 odd years after that was done, uh, Groningen Chamber of Commerce is one of the, the strongest supporters of sustainable transport and they believe that you know, this has been a, a key element in their success. But that wasn't what they were saying at the time. And so all the same sort of problems that we have over here, um, the leaders of those cities had to deal with um, in sort of you know, moving these solutions forward. So the implication is that what's and all reporting would have been more useful? Yes, definitely, definitely. And that's what I'm trying to do uh, in, in this book. And the other thing is, it takes a long time. You can't do it overnight. These things take decades. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm. I mean, in some cases there are, you, you can trace, like, there's one big radical thing that makes the difference, but it always, in all of these countries, in all these cities, change takes time. Now, I'd spent quite a bit of time study, you know, visiting and, and studying um, these continental European examples, and it was really only when I started thinking about writing this book that I, I started to pay more attention to... British cities which have um, made significant progress. So, and I've picked three out in particular for slightly different reasons. London, <coughs> Brighton, and Cambridge. Um, many differences, obviously very different in terms of size, um, but things that they have in common, um, that they have brought down the rate of car driving quite significantly, um, they've also brought down car ownership, which I think is very important. Um, and I guess the, 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 some of the key differences are that in the case of London, uh, it has been particularly been about public transport, whereas um, Cambridge in particular, it's been more about um, cycling and, and walking. Um, <clears throat> I was particularly interested in Cambridge, and you get this. I'll give you my sort of take on this, and no doubt you will have um, some views of your own. Um, the when I was looking at the figures, there was something about this that didn't add up, because Cambridge was there were several things that were interesting, and I'm look interest looking here at the the rate of change, right, rather than necessarily the the absolute situation. People sometimes get those, those two things mixed up. So for example, I've heard people say, and some of my students, you know, the undergraduates in particular, tend to write this sort of stuff in their, their exams. You know, you say, well, why has cycling in Cambridge been going up for the last 20 years? And honestly, I've heard people say, and write, well, because it's flat. You know, to which my answer is, well, has it actually got any flatter since 1991? You know. um, <laughs> so, there are a number of things that were unusual about um, what was happening in Cambridge. One of them was that um, the, it had a combination of a rapidly expanding economy. You know, it was becoming, over the recent years, an affluent city, and a more affluent city quite rapidly. And at the same time, car ownership was plummeting. Right? Usually, those two things go in the same direction. In Cambridge, you know... The graph was crossing. So that was an interesting thing. Um, the, some of the explanations I'd heard, okay, apart from the ones which are clearly, you know, nonsense. I mean, a lot of people talk about students and the influence of universities. Now, you'll see there's quite a bit in the book about uh, the in, uh, influences that universities can have. But, you know, if we look at the, the census figures, students are not included. So, you know, all the sort of explanation about, well, well you know, the college don't, don't let people bring cars and all that, you know, that wasn't uh, explaining what, what was happening. So, there was, and if you compare Cambridge to some other cities that have some similarities, so, you know, relatively flat cities, university cities, started off with a high rate of cycling. York is an interesting example. The rate of cycling there has been declining over time, and yet Cambridge, which already had the highest rate, has continued to go upwards. Why was this? Well, 
So I, I felt that there was, a, there was kind of a missing element, and at an early stage in the book, and before I knew the answer to this, um, I actually cycled over here from Bristol um, and took a look around and interviewed um, some of the, the transport planners um, and um, somebody from the uh, Cambridge Cycling Campaign. And um, the, the key element, for me, the, the, the key element um, which I think makes the big difference and actually provides a link between Cambridge and some of the other examples, uh, particularly Groningen, uh, is essentially this. How many of you were here at the time of the what was known as the Cambridge Core Traffic Scheme? When was that? It, it actually took place over a number of phases. It started in the early 90s, and I think the last one was 2008. Yeah. Right. I don't know whether any of you were aware. It's one of these things like lots of what would appear to be pretty minor changes one at a time, weren't they? You know, bus gates, roses, roads closed off, bollards, etc. Um, but it actually, it was part of a much bigger plan. Um, again, I, you know, I understand that there were enormous battles uh, at the time. You know, I've gone back to records, I've interviewed people. Um, you know, you'll see some of the, you, that described in the book. I didn't appreciate that until I actually I'd come back, done all the interviews, um, and then back home and at the computer, I actually did a, uh, a little sort of experiment using. Google Maps, where I took a number of different points around the city and said, right, okay, let's compare the the distance um, by bike and the distance by car. And for amongst British cities, I think this is the most dramatic example I've ever found of the, this principle, which is known as filtered permeability. I know, filtered permeability basically means separating the, the different modes of transport in order to give an advantage to some over others. It was the key element to the success of, of Grinnegan. Basically, they started off by closing their city centre to... Well, actually, initially, they, they didn't even pedestrianise it. All they did at the beginning was divide it into four. Right? They, they, they took the, city, the town centre and basically cordoned it off into four segments so that um, you could still drive in you could, to any of them. You could drive in and you could drive out, but you couldn't get through them and you couldn't get across the city centre. That was what a lot of the battles were about in the 1970s. And then having got <coughs> that in, they gradually extended that principle out into the suburbs. So that if you look at the sort of the, the road map of Groningen today, um, there are a very limited number of roads that you can actually use for, for through traffic, um, sometimes you have to do quite a circuitous route if you're trying to go from one side of the city to the other. Um, whereas if you look at the, the routes for pedestrians and cyclists, they, they crisscross, they go in all directions, there are hundreds of them. Now, Cambridge wasn't quite that dramatic, but it did, by carefully choosing a few points, um, you've effectively achieved something similar in terms of the, you know, the ease with which it's possible to cross the city by bike or on foot, and the difficulty it, it takes to do the same trips by car. And that, I believe, is the key element that I was missing amongst all the other explanations that said why Cambridge was bucking so many of these sort of normal national trends. So the second, the sort of Second to last, and the last chapter of the book, um, deal with conclusions. Okay, what conclusions can we draw from all this? What can we do, be doing? What should we be doing? And then the final um, chapter is entitled, What Can I Do? And it looks at that question from three um, different perspectives. One of them is from a, a campaigning perspective. I don't know if some of you have been involved in campaigning on kind of these types of issues, or we might have an interesting discussion about that. And you can see some of my thoughts that I've sort of, what I've learned from sort of years of environmental campaigning. Um, there's then, what can I do looking at it from the point of view of 
transport professionals. I've interviewed a lot of people for this book. Now, some of them you'll know, people like Ken Livingston and Sir Peter Hendy, who's the um, Commissioner for Transport for London. Um, and... Sorry. There's a break for water, I suppose. <laughs> So they, they appear sort of named in the book. And then there are other people at various points who are anonymous, who are kind of off the record. And when you, you start reading it, you'll realise why um, you know, they insisted on talking off the record. Um, so I've, in that sort of final chapter, I've interviewed a number of transport planners who've got some really interesting stories to tell about what they have done to try to advance the sustainability agenda. In some cases, almost like acting as a mole in the system, you know, pursuing a, a different agenda from their, their bosses, and you know, they might be in trouble if, they've been, if they were found out. And then the, the final sort of part of that, you know, what can I do, I write from a, a personal perspective about you know, walking the talk. Um, when I started sort of getting seriously into this stuff, Ten years ago, um, I, particularly when I started looking at the transport implications for climate change, um, I made a number of de decisions. One of them was to stop flying. Um, another, which took a little bit longer, was to give up the car. Now, to do that, we had to move. We had to move from a. We lived in a village in a national park at the time. We moved into a, a flat in the centre of Bristol, and it's one of those things. You know, whatever any other decisions I've made in my life, that one I will never regret. And we might possibly talk about some of that. You may have some experiences of your own, one way or the other. Um, the last thing I was going to sort of leave it with before kind of opening it up to you was, I was going to say the, the process of writing a book like this um, is a lot tougher than you might imagine. Now, in this I've got to either credit or blame um, people like Neil and, and Lindsay. Um, you, you imagine when you've kind of, you know, you've spent a year sort of sweating blood and you've finished and that, that you know, I can relax and then this mm -hmm. Well, not a bit of it. It's really, you know, line by line, comma by comma. And Neil, um, I think I'll give him his due, uh, takes the view that, you know, approaches this saying, I know nothing. Right, so if it isn't straightforward, knowing nothing, if I can't sort of um, get it straight away, then neither will a portion of the readership, because this is not an academic book, right? I hate academic writing. I have to do it, you know, you have to do it as part of your job, but I think to compare sort of academic writing with normal writing is like <coughs> a comparison between sort of going for a bike ride in a country lane on a day like today versus sort of wading through mud in the middle of winter. You know? <laughs> um, so this is like the, you know, the ride in the sort of, in, in, in the countryside on a nice day. So anyway, one of the changes that came out of that editing process was this last bit was going to be, I think I'd initially I'd put it in part of the last chapter, and Neil said, no, no, this would be, take this out, put it as an epilogue. So it's one short paragraph, which I will leave you with. I'm writing this final paragraph in Paris on the steps that straddle the recently pedestrianised bank of the River Seine. I remember the network of roads along the two banks as a racetrack when I lived here one which would seal the fate of Princess Diana. Boats glide quietly opposite the Jardin des Tuileries where the, twi the trees are in blossom. It's a damp working day, but several people are sitting around me while others stroll, cycle or skate along the old road below. Some photography students set up their tripods while a man takes an impromptu video of four girls dancing in a line. The place still has a, a temporary feel. Over time, the old road surface will be replaced and it may grow to resemble the banks of the, the Rhone in Lyon, a monument to the folly of past generations and of hope for the cities of the future. Thank you. Thank you.